Great. Hi, Mark. Hi, Luis. Uh, very happy to, to be with, uh, with you here today. Thanks so much for taking the time uh, for this interview. Uh, and so you're both uh, known for being the first authors to have actually reached uh, the top of the charts on Amazon.co.uk a few years ago. With two years, yeah. that you had for written. Yeah. But like your collaboration started way before that, right? That's right, yeah. So can you can you tell me a bit a bit more about that, maybe, uh, Louise? Yeah, it's a it's a good story. Um, although it does make me sound a bit like a stalker. <laughs> it was years ago. It was about 1998, 99. And Mark was on this TV documentary about um, wannabe writers, and uh, I just I was in exactly the same situation as him. I had an agent, who was pretty enthusiastic, and I've written two books. And Mark was on um, Dr. Munch's day, he have done the same thing, he was getting loads of rejections, but like me, they were really positive rejections. So I just sent him a little email, care of his agent, and um, just basically saying, I really like your stuff, I hope you won't get any problems. And uh, he wrote back, so we became pals. And uh, we corresponded for about 18 months before we ever met. Because, um, Mark yeah. was in hosting and I was all somewhere. Where were you going? You were in London, weren't you? I was in London, yeah, I was in Twickenham. Yeah, um, I was in Hastings. We just, we just emailed, you know, quite often, but just always about books and writing and new designs. And then we started critiquing each other's work. And so by the time we finally did meet up, we kind of thought, well, rather than critiquing each other's stuff, why don't we try and write something together? And um, Josie Lloyd and Eminem Reese had recently written Come Together, that novel. It was a triplet sort of thing. So we thought that would be cool to do it, a thriller version. And so that's when we started writing Killing Cupid. We did it all by email, because Mark by then had moved to Japan. Yeah. Yeah. So I was in Tokyo and Louise was in London. And we wrote a whole novel without even speaking to each other. <laughs> did it? Yeah, we we literally didn't even speak on the phone, did we? We no, didn't speak on email. No. Um, and then we, Killing Cupid was um, optioned by the BBC, but even before it was finished, and Louise had a book deal by this point, but I still didn't. Um, and then we couldn't get a deal for Killing Cupid. This was in 2001, I think it was. Um, and then when I got back from Japan, um, a few years after, a few years after that, we decided to try and write another one together. I wrote Catch Your Death. By which point, we, we didn't have a deal. We didn't have an agent, and um, we were kind of both back at square one. And we still couldn't get a publisher for Catch Your Death. And I think we just pretty much gave up at that point, didn't we? This was yeah. I, mean, I think the problem was yeah. with Killing Cupid, we, when we sent it to publishers, it was a, a genre thing. And they all said, well, it's not really enough of a thriller to be a thriller. And, it, or, or it, and it's a comedy as well. And we don't know what to do with it. So, so we kind of thought that's why we decided to write Catch Your Death. Because we write something that was un Questionably, a thriller that you know, really crazy um, third person narrative. So, we had to try and unify our narrative voice at that point cause, because Kim Cooper had just been a male and female protagonist. But we just wanted to write an out and out thriller so that nobody could say, Oh, it's not quite enough of a thriller. But now, of course, you know, that doesn't seem to matter at all because there's so many sub genres of thriller. And yep. um, so, yeah, we, I think we. Both pretty much gave up. I didn't write. I, I came back to the UK, got a good job, thought it's not worth the pain <laughs> anymore of trying to trying to get a publishing deal. Um, because I had I spent years, over a decade, trying and had had no, had a couple of agents and just never quite got through that final stage of getting a deal. And then. So 2010 was when I first heard about um, KDP, yep. um, and I got a Kindle for my birthday, um, my 40th birthday, I think it was, and um, 
And I said to Louise, why don't we get up these two old novels and, and spruce them up a bit and, and self-publish them and, and um, see what happens. And she was very reluctant. I was like, oh no, it'll be humiliating. We'll sell about four copies. Of <laughs> nobody, will, you know, nobody will buy them. But luckily not persuaded me. Yeah, so then we spent, I guess we spent a few months mm -hmm. um, working on them and rewriting them because they were really out of date. Like there was no mobile phones, there was no social media. Um, everybody was smoking in pubs, weren't they? Yeah, there was, lo there was loads of stuff in it that made it seem quite dated. It's amazing how much the world changed in that kind of five, that five years between writing those books and self-publishing them. Um, and I think on our first, so we put Killing Keep It Live in February 2011. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was. Um, so yeah, four years ago now. And um, and I think as Louisa predicted, we sold about two copies on our first day to people that we knew. <laughs> um, but then I became quite obsessed with trying to. This was this. We only had Killing Cupid live at this point, and I became completely obsessed actually at trying to trying to sell it. And I had a full time job. My girlfriend was pregnant. She still talks about how I neglected her during that period because I was so. <laughs> I spent like all of us spent my spare time, probably about four, three or four hours a day, doing promotion. So I'd work all day and then get home and just sit on my computer and try and sell this book. And Louise was doing stuff as well. Yeah, I did stuff. We, too. Were... Um, we, we had a list of all the bloggers that would accept people who would review um, self-published books. And there weren't many of them, but we got this massive list and we divided it up. Uh, I think you started at A and I started at Z and we worked. We wrote to all of them and said, would yeah. they review our book? And, and, I mean, yeah, it was, a, it was a lot of work. Yeah, and... Sorry, you've asked one question and we're just talking for yeah. ages and ages. But uh, okay. <laughs> That's a good question. We've told this story a lot of times. Um, but, and um, you've done a lot of, uh, of, of work with metadata, right? Speaking well, and getting it right. That's what you've talked uh, about on Joanna Penn's blog. And yeah, well, we use, sub we use subtitles. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I think on Killing Cupid, it, just, it was just quite simply Killing Cupid, a psychological thriller. It wasn't anything particularly clever or fancy on that one. Um, but um, we kept rewriting the blurb, the book description. So back then, you used to be able to see what percentage of people who viewed your book had bought it, which was fantastic. Um, you could see your conversion rate from um, browser to, to purchase. And so I kept looking at the book in the top ten, especially the self-published thrillers, and the ones that had higher conversion rates than us. And I was trying to work out what was it about those books that meant that more people were actually buying them after they looked at them, because they were all about the same price, about a pound. Um, and then the, there's obviously the reviews, which you can't do much about. Um, so I was constantly tweaking the description, um, and I think that finally got it right because at one I changed, made one big change to it, and doubled the, the sales pretty much within an hour. Um, change was I can't remember what what we changed. Well, it was just it was it was completely rewritten, um, just made it much more straightforward, um, shorter, and, and more just a more simple summary of of the plot and made it sound more intriguing. Um, so with the metadata thing, we did something quite controversial with our second book, Catch Your Death, because we called it um, Catch Your Death, open brackets, for fans of Dan Brown and Stig Larson, close brackets. Well, I see. And um, this this then um, became a bit controversial. People were talking about it in the bookseller magazine and 
and um, on forums and stuff. But I actually believe to this day that it didn't make any difference to the sales because I think we put off as many people as it attracted. Yeah. If you search for Dan Brown, because I did it at the time to check, if you search for either of those authors on Amazon, our book didn't come up, even on like the 20th page of results. It wasn't, it wasn't really? anywhere. Yeah, it, just, it didn't make any difference to the search results. Um, but what, what actually happened was that and this is the lesson for all indie authors, is that it's about being patient and building up a readership, is that we, we, we hand-sold every copy of Killing Cupid for the first three or four months. I mean, every sale was hard was work to get, to get somebody to buy it. And then, as we, as we did that, and it kind of slowly picked up momentum, it climbed the charts, more, it became more visible and more people bought it. And because it was good, um, it, it got that word of mouth thing and, and more people started to buy it. We then released Catch Your Death about three or four months after Killing Cupid. Um, as Killing Cupid was climbing into the top 100. And Amazon then sent out an email advertising Catch Your Death to all the people who'd already bought Killing Cupid at that point. And it was the day that that email went out, even though we didn't realize this until quite a long time afterwards. That email came out. Lots of people bought Catch Your Death on the same day. It shot up the charts into the top into the top 10. And it just took off from there. And a couple of days later, Amazon removed the Dan Brown subtitle. And it didn't make any difference to the sales at all. It went up to number one. It stayed at number one for a month. So, so there was a lot of hype about our metadata and our use of, of that subtitle, but actually, I, d I honestly don't think it made any difference at all. It was just about slowly building that, that readership through a lot of hard work, and then our, our readers then being keen to read a second book when that one came out and knew that it was out there. That's fantastic, and that's a great story. I love it. And, but if we go back to, to the writing process, Louise, how, how, how does that technically work? Like, do you use uh, Google, Google Drive or Dropbox or Dropbox. just Exchange? Yeah, everything, everything in Dropbox. Okay. And because you, know, you can see the last few things that have gone in and when they were worked on stuff. We, we used to have a problem sometimes. One of us would forget to, type, to save the document and leave it open, and then the other one would go and work on it, and then we'd have a conflicted copy, which is always a nightmare because we don't know which bits have been changed in which version. But we, we don't do that so much now. I think we've got better at it. Yeah. Us, it's, it's fine. We, we email a lot and text sometimes when, when it's kind of particularly urgent. Um, lots of sort of random text in the house, but we don't actually talk. We do if there's a problem. If we've hit a sort of pop snag, or at the beginning when we're trying to work out what to do, we usually meet up in Skype. Um, so we kind of, we, we talk face to face usually at the beginning and the end, don't we, normally? Yeah, and in the middle. <laughs> um, but you know, most of it's email. Yeah, we have, um, we have a, if people are interested in this in the, this level of detail, we have a master document. It's, we do it all in Word. We just have a master document, and then we write separate chapters in separate Word documents, save them into Dropbox. The other person then goes and makes comments and, or makes an edit. The original author then goes back and amends that chapter, and then when we're both happy with that chapter, we add it to the, to the master document. And then we use, um, we have other Word documents and Excel spreadsheets to, for our chapter plans, which we're both kind of changing and keeping an eye on as we go along. I think ideally we'd use Scrivener because we both use that to write our solo novels. Yeah. But you can't use it for collaborative working as far as I've been able to, to work out. Um, and also, one that you can use uh, that's really good, and I can't remember what it's called. I mean, I think I think we're kind of happy with the way we do it at the moment. Yeah, yeah, we've got a good process that we've worked out over the years. Um, 
and we end up with all these spreadsheets with coloured cells, coloured bright yellow, to tell us what Ursula really needs working on, and and it looks really geeky, but <laughs> it doesn't look like kind of pure create like you imagine a writer with their with their quill and their uh, their their um, notepad. It's all very, very high tech. <laughs> um, okay. and I also sorry I in. For work, I've often used Google Docs, where you you can actually see the other person editing and writing as you. But yeah. Google Docs on are, are good enough for um, for writing a novel. You can it's good for like a short document. But exactly. Yeah, it's just not powerful enough. This is just my email address. Just have to stand out. I can't use Google Docs here unless I get an email. That's true. <laughs> So, um, with the success of uh, Killing Cupid and Catch Your Death, you were prompted to look for an agent and found one, uh, and that got you into traditional publishing. So, how was that experience? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> who do you want to go first? Mark. Yeah, go, uh, Louise, go first. Oh. Anyway. <laughs> Well, I mean, it was it was quite ironic. We'd spent years looking for an agent for uh, both books, and then we didn't have an agent at all until we were at number one. And then I remember talking to a friend of mine, John Harding, who's an author, and he said, "Well, have you got an agent?" I said, "No." And he said, "You should you should definitely have one. Why don't you try Sam and his agent?" And I said, "Oh, no, we already sent it to Sam. He, he turned it down a few years ago." Oh, well, it's different now. You're number one. So we did. We did try him again, and he did. In his defence, he had just made twins when when he got it the first time. So he said, "I wasn't taking on anything." But so they came to us, and you know, he came to us in the end, and really quickly thereafter um, got us a deal with Harper Collins, which was fantastic. And I think we don't regret it in as much as it was just so lovely to have that kind of public validation and the traditional publishing deal and to be able to see our books in shops. Um, it, it just felt like the icing on the cake really, didn't it, after, and also that the advance was nice and um, I don't, you know, I wonder, with the benefit of hindsight, what we would do if we did it again, I suspect we'd probably do exactly the same thing. We just we would be more we would be more proactive ourselves in the marketing and publicity of those traditionally published books because we did we did take our foot off the gas a bit thinking that, that, that the publisher would do a lot of um, marketing and promotion yeah. and it sort of didn't happen. So that was our mistake, I think. Not not doing the deal but but not kind of pushing the books as much as we had our when we were self publishing. Yeah. Uh, exactly what Louise just said. She literally took the words out of my mouth. I mean, I think it was. I definitely don't regret it either. It was. It was. It was lovely. It was very exciting, and it was like a. It was. A, it was a dream come true. If that doesn't sound too corny, because it was something that. I mean, Louise had already had a traditional deal, but I'd wanted that for. Yeah. For years. I think I was a bit more cynical about it because I'd yeah. been through all that hype and excitement and then, you know, kind of four or so that was published um, from 2001 to 2005 and then the publisher dropped me um, and because they weren't, you know, but they hadn't done any promotion at all and that was in the days before you really be proactive yourself and, you know, there was no social media um, to speak of. And, you know, just, so, so I think I was a little bit more cautious, as I tend to be about most <laughs> most things. Um, but I still don't. No, I don't regret it at all. It, it was lovely, and we had a lovely editor who was really good editorially as well. I mean, she helped improve the book. Um, it was just a shame that, that nobody really kind of got to see them. Yeah, that's the that's the most, that was the frustrating thing is that what happened was that after the first book didn't do as well as they hoped, um, and then the second book did a little bit better but still not as not as well. Then the third and fourth books just 
were pretty much dead in the water before they'd even come yeah. out. I mean, they didn't. The exact, exact trajectory that my first publishing view took. You know, exactly the same thing. It just sort of <laughs> smaller and smaller as the, and the publisher's interest got smaller and smaller. But um, it's yeah, you know, that's, that's the way it often happens. But I think also we were hindered by the fact that two of the four books that we had with them had already been out and had already sold. In so. Um, you know, I don't think that actually helped us as much as we thought it would. No, this was that, that was the big problem is that the Catch to Death and Killing Cupid had come out again in the year in following their self publishing um, yeah. success. And so it was a whole kind of year and a half between Catch to Death coming out the first time and then the sequel to that book coming out, by which point. Well, everyone had lost interest in that, in that. And, and it wasn't pushed at all, it wasn't in any shops, and it was, it, it had no visibility. I think that, um, I actually think that we were a little bit like guinea pigs, because we were the kind of the first ones to go through that process over here in the UK anyway. Um, and, and some of the self-publishing success stories have been picked up by traditional publishers since. Um, the publishers learned from what happened with us, um, like with Kerry Wilkinson and James Oswald, they've both done really well with um, Macmillan and the Penguin. Um, and in fact, Philip Jones, the bookseller, wrote a column saying exactly this, that, that they, they kind of made sure to get new books, new product out from them, and they really kind of pushed on the paper side as well. And got them into the supermarkets and into Christian and Judy and things like that. So, um, yeah, I, 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 the main thing for me that we got from the Half a Coins deal was that it kind of gave us that that level of um, respect and kudos that is much harder to get as a as an indie author. I think, or at least three years ago when this all happened, anyway. I think it's a bit different now. I think that someone like Rachel Abbott, who's yeah. just sold her million book, self-published, gets a lot of gets a lot of respect now. And she's she's one of the people who's shown how you can do it. I don't think people even realise that she's self-publishing. You know, there's no. no. She does it so professionally. I don't. Think it's not that anyone. I don't think anyone looks at her, her and goes, oh, okay, yeah. she's done well. It's just she is. She is very, very professional. Mm. So, um, and, and sorry, so you, you went, yeah, no, no, you went to, you went from publisher that didn't like, they didn't do the marketing effort you were expecting, and so you maybe you relied too much on on, on the publisher for that, and now you're yeah. you're with Amazon, right? Which is the opposite. Yeah, well, there's a there's a stage in between, which was the yeah. I. So what happened then is that um, in January, February 2013, um, we were, I mean, we were at a really low ebb at that point. We'd, we'd had a very disappointing 2012 with the two paperbacks. Um, and then Awful Down, which was the third one, came out in January and had just disappeared without trace of means. I mean, it's literally without trace. It just did nothing. <laughs> and um, I, I had gambled by quitting my day job to become a full-time writer, and I'd moved out of London and bought a house and thought, well, this is the only chance I'm going to get to kind of really, really make a go of it. So with my wife's blessing, I did that. And... Um, and had and it hadn't worked, and I was in like quite quite severe financial difficulties. I'd like got a huge tax bill looming. I had massive credit card bills. My overdraft was maxed out, and had another baby on the way. And it was like I was just like having sleepless nights. I mean, I really was in a state of panic, like all the time. Like, what the hell am I going to do? I had like this. Yeah, I, I, do, I don't know. I mean, I can laugh about it now, but. <laughs> <laughs> it was terrible, it really was. Every now and then I kind of stop and think, I can't actually believe that I've managed to get myself out of that 
uh, that dark pit that I was in two years ago. Um, and I remember Louise and I had this meeting with our agent in London, and he was kind of... I mean, he I think he would, he would probably deny it, but I think he probably must be interested in, in us a bit at that point as well, because we weren't doing particularly well. and and um, But we were determined to make it work, so we thought we we're going to start a new series of books, um, and we're not going to not going to give up, we're going to keep going. Um, and then I I had this book called The Magpies that I had had um, sort of sitting in my bottom drawer for years and I've been tinkering with it on and off and thinking, oh, I might do something with this one day. And I, I said, Louise said, why don't you just, just do it, just self-publish it, just get it out there. And and I was like, yeah, sorry, I'm going to do it. And um, so I went home that day read through and thought, actually, this is, this is quite good. <laughs> it just needs a little, just needs a bit of work. Um, and so I then self-published the Magpies um, via my agent, because they do something called White Glove, um, which is agent-assisted self-publishing. And it basically completely transformed everything, because the Magpies um, Ended up selling in its self-published version 170,000 copies. Got to number one was like a huge hit, and that completely changed my life. And that was what then led to the the deal with Amazon, because Amazon Publishing that was just starting to set up in the UK. I think they just signed Mel Sherrett. She was the first one that they signed up. Um, we all know each other, all of us in the author, so like Mel's a friend of ours, and it's a very, it's a very incestuous little world where <laughs> um, there's like us and Mel and Rachel and Nick Spaulding and, and, and all these people, you always, they're always, I think two or three of them are in the top ten in Kindle at the moment, and we always kind of keep coming back, can't get rid of us, but um, the... The Amazon deal came from the, the success of the Magpies, and they basically um, bought the rights to it, plus another solo novel from me. And then when Louise and I finished our, our new co-written one, um, it did go out on submission to, to various publishers, but Amazon preempted it, and she read it like within a few days. Um, our, the, our commissioning editor, Amazon, Emily, um, I made an offer, and because I'd had such a great experience with Amazon already, and I was preparing to go back to another traditional publishing field as well. Um, you know, it was working for Mark, so I thought, why not? Yeah. So everything, everything so far with Amazon publishing has been fantastic. I mean, couldn't. I'd like to sell more books in the US, but in the UK, it's been, it's been. It couldn't have gone any better, really, I don't think. Yeah, no, we interviewed, like, Bob Mayer a few, a month or so ago, uh, and he's also published uh, by an Amazon imprint, and right. he said that they have an amazing marketing reach. What does that mean, exactly? What do they do for you in terms of marketing? Well, they've got, they've got the most amazing database in the world. They've got everyone who's ever bought anything from Amazon. They've got in their database, including everyone who's ever bought a thriller, a psychological thriller, um, one of my books, one of Louise's books. Um, they've got that data, and that's the thing that that sets Amazon apart from from all the other publishers. Yeah. Um, plus, of course, they've got the platform of their website. And also, they do quite a lot of on-device marketing. So if you've got a Kindle Fire, um, you'll see whenever you turn your Kindle Fire on, an advert will appear on the home screen. Um, and they, they rotate, but they're often books as well as other products. Um, and, and that visibility that you get from doing with Amazon Publishing is it's just fantastic. I mean. The, the restriction of being with Amazon is that you're pretty much only on the Amazon platform. Yeah. So, although they do make print books and they are making efforts to get them into the shops, and you can you can walk into a bookshop and order, 
one of our books, um, mm -hmm. or a library even. Um, they're not on any of the other digital stores, so so you are you're in a kind of a walled garden, like a gated, a luxury gated development, <laughs> which is a, which is better than being in a ghetto. <laughs> I mean, when somebody from a big publisher said to us, well, wouldn't you rather be with a traditional publisher and have your books in the shops? And and, and my answer was that, well, yeah, that's, that's, um, that all sounds great, but when we did have that opportunity or that experience, oh, our books were barely in the shops anyway. You might find one. You might find like one copy in your local Waterstones. Yeah. And that's about it. And do you now do a lot of marketing effort or is that all Amazon? Uh, do you want to go first, Louise? Yeah. yeah. Well we we've been we work really hard on building up our Facebook. Um, and it's it's really it's really noticeable how much happens. It's not it's not like we've got tens of thousands of fans and followers and stuff, but the ones we do have are so loyal that, that I think it's kind of really helping um, get the word of mouth thing going, which is which is the holy grail of marketing anyway, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so we've sort of worked hard on it. We do still work really hard on it. Um, when we do launch online launches and, and, and make sure that we do the whole, not just banging on about our own book, we engage generally on the, on the platform. And and so maybe to, to finish on a, on a nice note uh, and on an encouraging note for, for other authors out there, so you've been through everything maybe in, in a writer's career, both of you, the ups, the downs, so apart from hang in there, what, what would be your advice for, for an author who's uh, maybe in a, in a low year like you've had in, in 2012? Um. I think that, uh, sorry, I'm hearing a weird echo of my voice, it's just slightly off the volume. Um, um, I think it's, I think it's nurturing, nurturing your, your existing fans, fans, or your readers, mm -hmm. readers say, say. Um, um, that's, that's, that's what we, that's kind of what's got us through our Facebook group, where we've got really, really loyal, loyal readers, like Louise, like Louise, saying, saying. Um, um, they, they, were really, really helpful really in helpful kind of in acting as cheerleaders to keep us going. Going, and then when we and did, when we did, did, they were there and there and um, um, helped help with the word, the word. I see. And Louise. Well, well, keep going. Like you said, one of the things Keep going and keep going and keep going. Do it. Only, only. Love it. Love it. I see. Okay. I'm having a little recording problems over here. Yeah. So uh, I <laughs> think we're, we're going to uh, stop the interview now. Uh, I'll provide uh, everyone with uh, with a transcript of it uh, in a week or so. And uh, okay. thanks so much for taking the time for this. It's been real inspiring. Oh, thanks for having us. Thank, it. thank you. And good luck with uh, with the future. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks. Cheers. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.